Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Alhamdulillah praises be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Who has again guided us to be able to seek religious knowledge And there's a hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Awwalud din ma'rifatullah The beginning of the religion is that you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And our scholars have said that To get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek knowledge from the religious knowledge which is called aqidah Or some of the scholars say from the knowledge of tawheed Or some of them say ilmul kalam Whatever names uh, we used The most important is that we are seeking the knowledge of Getting to know the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And as well as Getting to know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And his attributes And his brother's attributes yani Amongst the messenger alayhi wa salatu wa salam Now Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala alihi Alhamdulillah It's nice to have you guys here for us together to discuss on religious matters. And now, why it is important for us to seek the knowledge from Aqidah? Why is it important? It is important because, number one, you want to know who you are worshipping. We want to know who are we worshipping. We always mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, Allah, Taib. What are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And what are the things which is wajib for Allah And what are the things which is impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So that you know who you are worshipping And if someone asks you or someone tries to confuse you about Allah Or uh, we and ascribe Allah with anything else Which is not right So we are able to protect ourselves from all these bad influences And we should know Al-Aqidah We mentioned about the creed Al-Aqidah What does Al-Aqidah mean? Al-Aqidah means something which you ties in your heart Or something which you ties with your Iman Which you tie with your Iman And you will bring it together with you Until you go You return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In the grave And nothing should change your aqidah or your beliefs. Something which you tie together with you until you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why it is called aqidah. And there's only one aqidah in Islam. There is no second or third aqidah. Except that sometimes some other groups, they will call themselves, they have their aqidah. Aqidah of this group, aqidah of that group, aqidah of this group, aqidah of that group. In the reality, the real aqidah is only one. Tamam. The aqidah which has been believed by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the aqidah which has believed in by the Sahaba radhiyallahu anhum. That's all. There's only one aqidah. There's no such thing as this aqidah, this group's aqidah, that group's aqidah. The real aqidah is only one. Except that sometimes, or um, uh, why the reason we use uh, aqidah of this group. Or beliefs of this group Taman. It is because These things are being discussed In the knowledge of Aqidah That is why sometimes we call the Aqidah of this one The Aqidah of this The Aqidah of this And what we are going to learn Is the Aqidah which has been used By Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam And what has been believed by the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum ajma'in Rabbil fili wa tub alayya inna ka anta tawabur rahim Now At the same time Learning aqidah means Learning the beliefs of all The kind of beliefs Which has been believed by the Prophets Alayhimu salatu wassalam And aqidah cannot be changed Since the time of Nabi Adam Alayhi salam Until the end of time 
the aqidah at every single time or every single era is the same. Yes, shara'i or what we call it, what we call as rules or laws of religion might be changed along the way. An example during the time of Nabi Musa, the laws are slightly different than during the time of Nabi Isa. And then our the laws that we have today, our Sharia, Sharia to Islam might be slightly different from the time of Nabi Isa or Nabi Musa or Nabi Adam alayhi salam. It differs from one era to another era. Not everything, some things. There are some things that it will not be changed at every single time. An example, the prohibition of zina. Since the time of Nabi Adam alayhi salam until the end of time, zina will not be allowed at any time. The prohibition of uh, taking intoxicating drinks. It will not be halal at any moment since the time of Nabi Adam alayhi salam until the end of time. Because why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought Islam or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought every single religion to protect six things. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent all religion. Yani, actually, there's no other religion other than Islam. Since the time of Nabi Adam until, until today. Except that uh, after some times, they give themselves some names. Tamam. And then it is called Yahudi. And then it is called Majusi. And then it is called Nasrani. And whatever it is. There is no religion except for Islam since the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Nabi Adam alayhi salam until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And there are proofs from the Quran saying that the Prophet uh, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Wa ana min al muslimin and I'm amongst the Muslims. And Nabi, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, what did he say? He himself say that he's amongst the Muslims. So there is no other religion other than Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought shara'i, or laws, or whatever it is in uh, laws or rules in, in, in religions, tamam, to protect six things. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religions to protect their religion. Which means they should not believe other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they should follow the teachings of the prophets of their time. For us, we are supposed to follow the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and for the, for those uh, followers of Nabi Isa, they should follow they should follow the teaching of Nabi Isa alaihi salam. For those who live during the time of Nabi Musa alaihi salam, they should believe the teachings of Nabi Musa alaihi salam, and so on. And now. Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought religions to protect six things. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religions to protect their religion. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religions to protect their lives and people's lives or our lives or whatever it is. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religion to protect their wealth. Tamam. For those who want to write it down, please write it down. Number four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent their religion to protect their intellect. Your aql. Tamam, your intellect. Number five, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religion to protect lineage. Nasab. Number six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent religions to protect their dignity. So things got to do with these six things, tamam, has not been changed, the prohibition of these six things has not been changed since the time of Nabi Adam alayhi salam until the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. The ways punishment being carried out on these six things might differ from time to time. But the prohibition of these six things has not been changed at all. Which means at every time, these six, these, uh, six things will always be prohibited. And on the discussions of attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tamam. 
actually it's quite a long class once a month inshallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us to complete these discussions tamam tayyib Now, number one, let's go to our discussion. We say, and our trust in Allah, praise be to Allah, the Creator, the Restorer, the Doer of whatever He wills. He whose throne is glorious and whose power mighty, whose guides the elect to the orthodox path and the right way. Who grants them benefits once they affirm, once they affirm, his unity by guarding the articles of faith from the obscurities of doubt and hesitation, who leads them to intimate the way of his chosen apostle, yani Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to follow the example of his most honored companions by directing their footsteps to the way of truth, who reveals himself to them. In his essence and his works, by his beautiful attributes, which none perceive except who inclines, except he who inclines his ear in contemplation, who makes known to them that he is one in his essence, without any associate, without any associate, single and fard, without any compare. Eternal, as samad. As samad actually means something where uh, everyone returns to when they are in need. That is the meaning of as samad. It doesn't mean eternal. Eh? Single is far. That's right. Without any compare, eternal. Yeah, yani. As samad means something which people returns to when they are when they are in need. Every single thing from the creation, they will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they, when they have need. Taib, without any opposite. Jalla jalalu. Separate, munfalib, without any like. He is one, ancient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, qadim, means pre-existence. Okay. With nothing preceding him. Eternal, azali, without any beginning. Abiding in existence. With none after him, everlasting, and abadi, without any end, subsisting without yes, cessation or cessation. What they call here? Uh, cessation, abiding without termination. He has not ceased, and he will not cease to be described by the epithets of majesty. At the end of time, he will not be subject to dissolution and decay. But he is first and the last, the eternal and the internal. And he knows all. Jalla Jalalu wa ta'ala fi'ula. Rabbil firli wa tum alayya inna ka anta tawabur rahim. Give me a second. Eh? Do you have white bot? That's a white bot. That's white wall. Huh? My light. Or is it white board? Huh? White wall. Right. Give me a second, huh? بطش شديد الهادي وصفة العبيد إلى منهج الرشيد ومصر بسديد المنو
طيب number one I think all of us have memorized the 20 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala تمام طيب before we go into the 20 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let's write them down first write them down in Arabic anyone who knows how to write the attributes of Allah in Arabic huh? sing sing like Han Song huh? Tamam. It's not a problem. For, it's not a problem for you to sing or whatever it is. Later, you go back home, you can sing together. Tamam. <laughs> Make a choir group or whatever it is. Now we should write the attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The twenty attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and then we will come into the discussions of those twenty attributes. Tamam. Differences of opinions and this and that, whatever it is. تمام All of you got a exercise book Make sure you have exercise book with you all the time. No. All my classes, anyone who comes, always bring one exercise book. There are always notes to write down and there are always homework. <laughs> oh, who doesn't have a book or anything, give them a paper or something. Organizer, please try to help. Tamam, 20 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trying to understand more from what you have known in the past. Tamam. Allah, wujud, idam, baqa, mukhalafatul, hawadith, qiyamuhu bin nafs. All these attributes, yes, you might have memorized, but do you know the meanings of every single attribute? What are the things that got to do with these attributes and what are the things that not supposed to be together with those attributes? These are the things that we might not be aware of. Bear in mind that we are not learning anything other than the six pillars of Iman. We are learning the same thing except that we are going a little bit in advanced level. Tamam. Alamak, you cannot see. Can you see? Can you see from the other side? You cannot see just pandai-pandai.
Oh. We have a black white wall there. Boleh pakai ke sana? Ah, oh, sini kesian lelaki. -laki. Sabar tulis dulu. Who knows all these, all the meanings of these house of Allah, the attributes of Allah before today? Huh? You know? You know all the meanings of the attributes of Allah before today? Labas. Who knows? Or who? Doesn't know the name, the meanings of the attributes of Allah before today. Asha Allah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Tamam. Very shy. Ah, very shy. Thay. There are two things in when it comes to knowledge. Huh? You shouldn't be shy and you shouldn't be proud. Because if you are shy, you will not seek knowledge properly. The same things go when you are proud. You will not be able to seek knowledge properly <coughs> so uh, the one of the, some of the things which is being done by the sahabiyat radiyallahu anhunna the lady sahabas imam, they used to ask on the matters of hayd and nifas and whatever liquids that comes out from their rahim until rasulullah sallallahu face turned red they were not shy at all when they were asking rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the matters of their rahim tamam that is why Sayyidina Aisha radiyallahu anha said that May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the ladies of Ansar Their shyness did not prevent them from seeking knowledge They were the most shy living ladies on the face of earth But it did not prevent them from seeking knowledge They asked Rasulullah sallallahu so much About the things and the matters got to do with their the liquids that comes out from their rahim. Write it down first. After this, we will explain one by one. Done, guys? Ladies, done? MashaAllah. Now, in the first place, when we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to learn about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Type these 20 attributes, mashallah, I've learned in scholar of government before. Maybe 20 years ago. Why is this Ustaz going to mention the same thing over and over again? Type what you have learned in scholar of government, mashallah, tabarakallah. What you have memorized from the Nasheed of Raihan, mashallah, tabarakallah. Today, we are going to try, going to, try to understand some of the meanings of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going to mention here what we are going to teach are all very basic high level things 
are to be discussed at scholarly levels. These are things which is necessary, which a Muslim should not don't know about this thing. Uh, every single Muslim should know about these basic st basic things we that we are going to mention. Tamam. So if you are able to bring your friends to get to know to understand the, the attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, then that is a form of da'wah. Tayyib. Now the first attribute of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Now when we some some people say the attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Tamam. There's ninety nine names of Allah. Why do you only mention 20? Tamam. There are many other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why you only mention some of the attributes of Allah here? Now we're going to mention about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that got to do with His essence. And the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are going to be discussed in the knowledge of Aqeedah. There are other attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is not discussed in the knowledge of Aqidah. Maybe it's going to be discussed in the knowledge of Tasawwuf. Maybe it's going to be discussed in some other knowledge. But we are going to mention about these attributes and these attributes are things got to do with Aqidah. The first attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wujud, exists. Now, a simple explanation. Um, how do you know Allah exists? How do you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists? Number one, huh? I hear something interesting. What is it? It might be right. Be through the creations. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists? Through the creation. That's right. When we look at the creations, we can extract five attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we, not only look, eh, when we ponder at the creation. When we ponder at creations, we are able to extract five attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the creations. This not only got to do with Allah, it might also be got, uh, got to do with Inventions. Someone invented something. Someone invented a pen. You can, uh, you can extract five attributes from a person who invented the pen, or maybe this, or maybe that. What else? Jalla Jalalu wa Taala fi Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. When you look at something, an example. Let's look at. Let's go to the level of our understanding. It's easier for us to understand when we look at a building. When we look at IMU, mashallah. This building, big building, huh? mashallah, yes, yeah, big building. Right. When we look at this building, we are able to extract five attributes behind this building. Number one, this building is not, yani this building will not be here unless there is someone who has built this building. And that someone has to be exist. It doesn't make sense that someone from nowhere, yani, or there's no one, suddenly just the building come. Oh, mashallah is here. Does it make sense? Who built this building? No one. It doesn't make sense. It is against logic and it is against the law of creation. So by just pondering at the building, we can we are able to extract the attribute of existence that means there is someone has created this building number two when we look at this building type there's someone who has created these buildings and he has to have few attributes to be able to create this building type some of the attributes are that he has to have the knowledge to create this building Am I right? If he's not able, if he doesn't have the knowledge to create this building, an example we give doctors, mashallah, our future doctors. We let doctors build. Is that possible? Not possible. We have to give someone who has the knowledge on buildings. 
We have to give to the architect. We have to give it. To, we have to give to the contractors. They have knowledge on buildings, and they are able to build. So we have to give the, the task of building to those people who have the knowledge of building. Which means when we see this building, we have extracted two attributes. Number one, we have extracted that there is someone who is who exists before this, yeah, and who has created this building, and the one who creates this building or be part of contribution to create this building, has to have knowledge. He has to have knowledge. Otherwise, he is not able to build. Type. After having knowledge, um, he must be type. Now, we, ha we got two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from what we have discussed about. Number one, al-wujud. Number two is an. Number two is al knowledge of yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. Tamam. Number three, when we look at this building, type a person who exists. Now I'm here. Type. And then I have the knowledge of yani construction. I know how to build. But I don't want to build. Yani, do you want to build? You have the knowledge of construction? Yes. Why? You don't want to build. Maybe because the price is not good, whatever it is. The most important is that I don't want to do it. Can that thing happen? No, it's not able to happen. So he has to have the will to do it. Now, I'm here. I have the knowledge of construction. And then, I want to, I want to do it. Type. But I don't have the ability to do it. An example, na'udhu billah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us from all this. An example, I go into the hospital and I'm sick. Tamam. I don't have the strength to do it. Can I do it? No, I'm not able to do it. So now we have to be exist. Tamam. And then we have to have knowledge. And then we have to... We have to have the will to build. We have to have the strength to build. Number, number five. Type. This fulan is exists. This fulan have the knowledge. This fulan have the will. This fulan have the strength, but he's not alive. Is he able to build? La. So, the, these are the five attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can extract by pondering at the creation. Type. Most people... Tamam. They won't be able to just simply understand these things. Tamam. Which means you're not able to extract five attributes of something behind inventions or creations. This takes high level of thinking to be able yani, to come out with these five things. And this has been come, yani, our scholars and the ulama radiallahu anhu ajma'in. They are those people who have came out with these five things. At the same time, we're going to mention again all these 23 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't come from our mind. None of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come from a person's intellect. All these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala come from the, from the Quran. From the Quran. Even though when we say that we, can, we are able to extract five attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by just pondering at the creation, it does not mean that it comes from our mind or it comes from scholars' mind, an example. Now, we are going to mention again that all these attributes come from the, come from the Quran. So, these are the five attributes that now we are able to understand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi'ula. It's warm, eh? Tamam. A little bit. Imagine how many layers of clothes I'm putting on. Tamam. This is Malaysia, MashaAllah. We studied in Tarim. It's 40 plus, almost, almost 50 degrees. Tamam. That's why when it comes to seeking knowledge, you always have to be patient. Without patience, you will not be able to get knowledge. Sleepy, tired, challenges, sick, hot, hungry, whatever it is. Tamam. When it comes to knowledge, knowledge always comes first. Tamam. And Remember, true challenges, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will groom your akhlaq through challenges. True challenges, you will get wisdom.
through challenges you will get akhlaq without challenges tamam you will be left out without anything that is why whenever we get any kind of challenges we have to remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he give you challenges he wants to groom your akhlaq he wants to groom your iman that is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you challenges طيب five attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now we are going to go into another five attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tamam which we will not discuss like how we have discussed these five attributes but these five attributes is being discussed by the knowledge of by the scholars of philosophy which we will not mention here is going to be quite complicating for those who are not used to the deep level of uh, knowledge of aqidah tamam but these five attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tamam from qidam baqa mukhalafatuhu lil hawadith qiyamuhu bin nafs wahdaniyah these five attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the attributes that a god must have it is being discussed by the philosophers tamam god must have these five attributes before you call something a god or because before you call some essence a god you have to make sure that this god have these five attributes if anything doesn't have these five attributes it cannot be called as a god and this is known uh, in the knowledge of philosophy tamam so now let us look back it has to pre exist azali what they mentioned here tamam ancient and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no beginning for allah we will go in details on the discussion of the attributes now we're just going to mention about the rough idea about the, uh, about all these attributes that we're going to learn tamam so allah yani a god number one he must after having these five attributes god must have this attribute number one pre exist which means there's no beginning number two baqa which means eternal number three mukhalafatuhu lil hawadith a god must be totally different from creations there should not be any kind of resemblance of any kind of creation tamam and then number four it should be independent qiyamuhu bin nafs and then god should be god should be unique tamam now all these attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as how we have mentioned tamam now all these 10 attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or all 20 attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as how we have mentioned is taken from the taken from the quran except that these 10 attributes of allah tamam we are able to understand these 10 attributes through our intellect that means our the ability of our intellect is able to understand these attributes of allah even though if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not mention about this attribute in the quran tamam which means human being they are able to derive these 10 attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if the quran were not sent down or even if Allah did not mention these these ten things in the Quran, but Allah SWT has mentioned everything in the Quran. Type now going to the next three attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala: sama, basar, and kalam. The hearing of Allah, the vision of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and Allah Subhanahu the conversation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These three attributes we are not able to understand or our mind is not able to derive these three attributes by just pondering at the creation or high level of philosophy or whatever it is now we know these three attributes through revelation only because of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought down in the quran and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that he hears he sees and he converts or he speaks but remember again the hearing of Allah, the vision of Allah, and the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala converts or speak is totally different from the way human beings do or any other creations do. Jalla Jalalu wa ta'ala fi'ula. 
And the seven, the last seven attributes. Now let's go into the discussion of the last seven attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. We now we see kaunuhu qadiran, kaunuhu muridan, kaunuhu aliman, kaunuhu hayyan, kaunuhu sami'an, kaunuhu basiran, kaunuhu mutakallima. Jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi'ula. Allah Now these seven attributes are taken from the first uh, or what we call it from the last seven attributes before the seven attributes. Which means when we see from number seven, tamam. Kudra, irada, ilm, hay, sama, basar, kalam. The last seven attributes are the continuation of these seven attributes. Tamam. Which means when we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a strength, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowledgeable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is living, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala converts. We also have to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously speaks, continuously hears, continuously living, which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was hearing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is hearing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hear continuously. Before that, we just mentioned the attribute of strength, power, will, knowledgeable. But we did not mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be continuously have the strength, continuously have the knowledge, and continuously living. Jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi'ula. Now, before we go into the discussions of the last seven attributes, let's get back to the aqidah of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The belief or the creed of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Our scholars radiyallahu anhum ajma'in from the scholars of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they are those people who have come out with the arrangement of Aqidah. They did not come out with something new from the knowledge of Aqidah. The knowledge of Aqidah is the same as how we have mentioned, as how, as how he was brought by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how, as how he was brought by the prophets before sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Except that when uh, problems on Aqidah begins more and more, there comes one Imam who is known as Abu Hassan Ash'ari. Tamam. Or another Imam who is called Abu, uh, Abu Mansur al Maturidi. Tamam. They, these two people, or these two great scholars, tamam, amongst Many scholars who have come and arranged the knowledge of Aqidah and they have given a lot of stress and attention on the knowledge of Aqidah. When we mention about Aqidah of Imam Al-Ash'ari, it does not mean these are the beliefs of Imam Al-Ash'ari. These are the beliefs of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are the beliefs of the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhu Majma'in. Except that these scholars, these great scholars, they have given a lot of attention to the knowledge of Aqidah and they have made, they have brought all the discussions of Aqidah into one book, into one compilation, and they call the book named Aqidah. So now we call, we call Aqidah Imam al-Ash'ari just because he is the one who has compiled the knowledge of Aqidah. Comes another side of the world is Imam Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. He also compiled and give a lot of stress and knowledge of Aqidah. And those who is after Imam Abu Hassan al Ash'ari and Abu al Mansur al Maturidi follows, especially amongst the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, when they mention about Aqidah Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they will refer it back to Imam al Ash'ari and Imam al Maturidi. And all the scholars, they will let themselves involved in one of the two madhabs, yani Madhab al Ash'ari or Madhab al Maturidi. The, again we have mentioned the knowledge of Aqidah is being referred to their names because they are those people who has who has put a lot of effort and has made a big uh, ish, has distinguished clearly the knowledge of Aqidah between the truth and the false one. At the same time we do not say that those people before them like Imam Shafi'i or Imam Al-Hanafi they did not do anything. La. They did a lot of things. Except that these two Imam has made the knowledge of Aqidah clear academically. Tamam. Taib. Now, and we have to remember 
whosoever follows the teachings of Imam al maturidi will be called as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Whosoever follows the teachings the, of Imam Abu Hassan al Ashari will be called as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And the teachings of both of them is not taken except from Quran and Hadithul Mutawatir. When we mention about knowledge of Aqidah, it has the source of knowledge of Aqidah has to come from two sources. Number one from the Quran and number two Hadith Mutawatir which means Hadith which is widely known and it is valid in Islam. It's difficult for me to explain why it's Hadith Mutawatir. For those who understand Mustalahul Hadith, they will be able to understand. For those who doesn't understand what's Mustalahul Hadith, then it will be difficult because to understand the Hadith Mutawatir itself, it's a, another long discussion. But we're gonna, what we're going to say is that knowledge of Aqidah only taken from Quran and Hadith Mutawatir. Tamam. Quran, yes, of course, you cannot disbelieve our Quran. Disbelieving our Quran will result you to kufur. Tamam. To be a disbeliever. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protection from disbelief. Taib. And we have to remember between these two madhabs, tamam, there's a lot of similarity and there's slight differences. Oh, this differences comes from the Quran. This differences from Hadith Rasulullah sallallahu Most of the, of the differences comes from the way of explanation. Most of the differences come from the way of understanding certain things. Or more, most of the differences comes in arranging this matter, whether it's here or it's supposed to be here. There are slight, small differences between the two madhabs tamam, which does not fall on the major beliefs tamam, all these things you will only be able to understand as you go further insha'Allah let me try to explain to you some of the differences between the two madhab and this, the differences between the two madhab it's only because of term use or way of understanding Terms used or way of understanding. Time number one. Now we look at the kaunuhu, 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 kaunuhu. The seven kaunuhu. Kaunuhu qadiran, kaunuhu muridan, kaunuhu sami'an, kaunuhu basiran, kaunuhu hayyan, kaunuhu mutakallima, kaunuhu alima. These seven attributes is being emphasized by madhab al-maturidi. And it is also being emphasized by Madhab Imam al Ash'ari. Except that Madhab Imam al Ash'ari, tamam, Madhab Imam al Ash'ari, they put these seven attributes under, under the seven attributes before this. Now, an example for Madhab al Ash'ari. When you mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has strength, tamam. For Madhab Imam al-Ash'ari, they will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continuously have strength. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continuously have the ability. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always in a state of power. Continuously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been strong in the past. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong forever and ever. For Madhab al maturidi they will say no. When you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong, you did not emphasize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you did not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously strong. For Madhab Imam al and they say, yes, for us when we, say, when we mention about the strength of Allah, means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always strong. Jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi ula. So Madhab Imam al-Maturidi, for them, it is not clear to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously strong unless you make, you put it down. You separate. Now, first you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong, and then you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously strong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously able to do something. The same goes for irada. When you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. You did not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously wills. 
يعني when you will something you might will you might not will and Allah subhanahu wa taala is always in a state of willing. When we mention kaunuhu, Allah subhanahu wa taala is always in a state of having the strength. Allah subhanahu wa taala is always able, and Allah subhanahu wa taala always create some things all the time, non-stop. Allah subhanahu wa taala always will. Allah subhanahu wa taala always knowledgeable. Allah subhanahu wa taala is always living. Allah subhanahu wa taala is always hearing. Continuously, He is hearing. Allah subhanahu wa taala is always seeing. Allah subhanahu wa taala is always is always conversing. Tamam. Rabbil fili wa tumalaya inna kanta tawabrahim. So far, it's clear. Is it clear so far? Tamam. Is it clear? Aywa. That's how we have mentioned. He added his seven because to him. Yeah, I many shubhat comes, many doubts comes along the way. When they say Allah SWT is like this, in other ways, no, Allah SWT is not like that. But for Imam Al-Ash'ari, it is clear. When we mention Allah SWT has the ability, Allah SWT is strong, which Allah SWT is always strong. Now, let's mention about the... At the same time, now we're going to say it is wrong. An example for those Ash'ari followers... They could if they they will deny the last seven attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's not right. When we say there is no need to put it there, at the same time we say that you should not deny because why? As how we have mentioned the seven last seven attributes of Allah, we have put it under the other seven of attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. طيب we mentioned Ash'ari Maturidi, Ash'ari Maturidi. Who follows Ash'ari and who follows Maturidi? Tamam. Generally, those who follow Madhab Shafi'i, Madhab Maliki, Madhab Hanbali, they follow the beliefs of Imam Al-Ash'ari. Madhab Al-Ash'ari. Those who follow the teachings of Imam Hanafi, they will be following Madhab Al-Maturidi. Tamam. And there's always slight differences between these two beliefs. Madhab Al-Maturidi, and Madhab al-Ash'ari. That is why we have to know and we have to learn. Sometimes, some people, they might have their teachers who follows Madhab Hanafi, an example. But what he is taught here in Malaysia is something else. And what all the teachers and scholars here say, something else. And then you start to say, oh, my sheikh is teaching something else. Yes, I believe he is my sheikh. He's a scholar, mashallah. But all the ustad here, they are mentioning something else. All the ustad are wrong. My teacher is the only one who is right. So we have to be careful from saying those kind of things. Your teacher is right, and the scholars here are right as well. So what you have to do? You have to seek knowledge to remove your ignorance. Then only you will know whether what is right and what is wrong. And... Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi You are able to understand where your sheikh is going And where your sheikh is What your sheikh is speaking And also what the teachers are teaching here For us In uh, in Southeast Asia, mashallah Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines uh, South Thailand maybe Or Thailand uh, Brunei All these few countries We will follow the teachings of Imam Shafi'i. Therefore, we also abide to the teachings of Imam Al-Ash'ari. Taib. Then why do they why do they teach us twenty sifat, twenty attributes of Allah? Now we say that we are Ash'ari. Why do they have to teach us twenty attributes of Allah? Why can't they just tell us thirteen attributes of Allah? This is to act. This is actually. 
to remove confusions amongst the public so that they will not be confused and they will not deny these seven attributes if they will hear sometimes because why most people are not like you guys mashallah you come to class and seek knowledge most people they are satisfied i do salah i work i search halal rizq tamam i don't do maasiyah i go holidays i get married i'm happy most people are like that not everyone is like you if everyone is like you mashallah then there will not be enough space here not even the whole i am you imam rabbil kulli wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim therefore praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amongst many muslim students allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have chosen you to come here today and seek religious knowledge taib rabbil kulli wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim now we start to understand the elite the slight differences amongst two madhab the madhab imam al ash'ari and madhab imam al maturidi rabbi ighfir li wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala alihi these 20 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wajib upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 20 compulsory attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which means it is impossible that at any time one of these attributes is removed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have these attributes all the time continuously non-stop the whole world is destroyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still have these 20 attributes the whole world uh, yani people are sent to mahsyar Allah still have these 20 attributes everyone goes to the hell na'udhu billah we ask Allah protection Allah still have these 20 attributes everyone goes to jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still have this 20 attributes non stop as how we have mentioned when we mentioned about aqidah it cannot be changed at any point of time rabbil firli wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim now let's go to the first attribute of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> now it's mentioned in this book huh? so let's go according to what the book have discussed with us anyway let me mention something about this book before we study the book anything inshallah rabbi firli wa tub alayya innaka anta tawwabur rahim this book tamam if you know ihya ulum din you know ihya ulum din tamam ihya ulum din of imam al ghazali these are some of the chapters from ihya ulum din tamam Imam Al-Ghazali radiyallahu anhu may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him rida and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give mercy on his soul he has put a lot of effort in writing this book Ihya al-Muddin it has been one of the most or one of the greatest book in in uh, in uh, in the world since the time he has created until today since the time he has authored this book until today Imam Al-Ghazali radiyallahu anhu he radiyallahu anhu he died at the age of Berapa? 40? 40 plus? Ha? Berapa? 52? Oh, lama. A, B, C, D, E. Nak kena kasih apa? Multiple choice question. MCQ. Imam Al-Ghazali radiyallahu anhu, he passed away at the age of 55. He was born at the year of berapa? Which year he was born? Ha? Huh? Masha'Allah. So explain here. Huh? He was born at the age of he was born at the year of 450 Hijrah. And he passed away at the year of 500 and Sure. Yeah, na. Of course, ah. Tamam, masyaallah tabarakallah. Barakallahu fik. Was the right answer. So he was born at the age of 400 uh, of the year of 450 Hijrah 
and he passed away at the year of 505 Hijrah. And Imam Al Ghazali radiyallahu an, we are very lucky to have him as a Madhab Shafi'i. He's a Shafi'i. Yeah? He used to be a Shafi'i. Therefore, he, when he speaks about the knowledge of Aqidah, he will be speaking on the knowledge of the Ashari. Suitable for our country, suitable for ourselves. At the same time, we respect Imam Ghazali. So, people like us, mashallah, those who abide to the teachings of Imam Shafi'i, will have maximum benefit from the teachings of Imam Al-Ghazali and they are, able, they are even, they even able to practice the teachings of Imam Ghazali in their daily lives. From those people who they practice from other madhab, yes, they might be able to benefit a lot from Ahiyya uh, Alubiddin or the teachings of Imam Al-Ghazali, but they might have to leave certain practices because uh, they have to obey their madhab. But the scholars, mashallah, whatever it is, they still like the teachings of Imam Al Ghazali. In fact, Imam Al Ghazali, Ihya Al Din, is one of the greatest book have been authored in Islam. And our scholars mentioned that if there is no other book other than Ihya Al Din, then it will suffice the whole world up to that extent. Imam Nawawi he said that Kad Al Ihya U An Yakuna Qurana. It is almost Ihya to be like a Quran. That is a great praise. Huh? At the same time, it cannot be a Quran because why? Because Quran is protected from mistakes and everyone else, they are not protected from mistakes. But Ihya is so great. And look at the intention of Imam Al Ghazali when he was writing Ihya Ulubiddin. What was his intention? His intention just as the title of the book Ihya Ulubiddin. Revival of the sciences of religion. Which means, yes, we have knowledge. Everyone have knowledge. You always seek knowledge. But how do you bring this knowledge into practice and make, it, make this knowledge being seen in the public? This knowledge should not only be learned and memorized. But these knowledges should be practiced and should be put alive in People's life. Rabbil Firli wa tum alayya inna ka anta tawabur rahim. So that is why today we are discussing on the book of Ihya Ulumiddin. Alhamdulillah, we are all, most of us, maybe maybe all of us are Madhab Shafi'i. Maybe most, uh, when you are Madhab Shafi'i, khalas, you abide to the teachings of Imam Al Ash'ari. And today we are going to learn from the book of Imam Al Ghazali, mentioning on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jalla Jalalu. There are four books on the attributes of uh, the discussion on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we are going through only through the first book. We will not go to the second book, neither the third book, neither the fourth book. There's a lot of philosophical discussion in the second and third and fourth book. We tried once to teach in Singapore, the second book of the Aqidah. But we realized and we were told that most of them didn't understand. Because why? There's a lot of philosophy discussions. And you need to know a lot about philosophy or you need to be used to that knowledge before you go and read what Imam Al-Ghazali teaches. It's very, very detailed, detailed discussion. Very, very detailed, small, small things which you might not be able to distinguish. This is this, this is that. Leave those things to the, to the scholars or to the philosophers. Now, transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tadzih, which means purify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need anyone to purify him. When we mention purifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the attributes which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not deserve, it is purifying in ourselves of the belief that we have on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need to be purified. Allah jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi ulahi is like that. Even though if everyone will disobey jalla jalalu, Allah will still be like that. If everyone worships and praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will still be the same. Allah will not change at any time. Regardless whether people obey him or people disobey him, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised himself more than everyone else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has purified himself before anyone can purify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Purify doesn't mean purify the cleaning, purify from the attributes, the wrong attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jalla jalaluhu wa ta'ala fi ula. When we mention about transcendence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tanzih, we are purifying on the wrong beliefs that we have in our hearts about things got to do with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu wa ta'ala fi ula. Number one, transcendence tanzid. We attest that he is not a body possessing form. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, laysa kabithlihi shay. Nothing resembles Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, he said that anything that you believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart, anything that you imagine about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is other than that for sure. Which means, our mind, we are not able to understand about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm, mashallah, I'm a philosopher, I can think deep. Come on. Whatever it is, how deep can you can think, you are still not able to understand on the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is wrong for us to believe Allah in any kind of body form. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have the attributes of creations. There are few attributes of there are few attributes which cannot be taken out from creations. An example shapes. We human being, we have shapes. Our nose is like this, our face is like this, our hand is like this. Tamam. Maybe square, maybe round, maybe rectangle, maybe triangle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from shapes. There is no shape for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shapes, colors. There is no color for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not, not white, neither black. There is no color for Allah. There is no shapes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the same time we should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not light. Oh, something bright come out. Oh, maybe it's Allah. No, it's not Allah. Because why? Light is the attribute of creation. And there is law for lights. Tamam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also not be moving, neither in a state of still. Because why? Creations it will have one of these two attributes. It either will be in a state of moving or it will be in a it will be still. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not moving, neither Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above imagination. And what we have to do when it comes to Allah, we should not busy or we should not keep ourselves occupied occupied thinking on the attributes of or thinking about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, our mind is not able to comprehend on the essence of, on the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi ula. So whatever you, you try to imagine about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is something other than that. Our mind is not able to understand on the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the first thing. We have to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when we mention about Allah, tamam, there are some things also will be discussed. An example. Sometimes people will ask. Tamam. An example, you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is up there. Up, eh? Let's understand the meaning of up. But he will be at the other side of the earth. Now when someone try to say Allah SWT is up, which up? This person is facing this up, and this person is facing this up. So there cannot be any direction for Allah SWT. Directions are the attributes of Creations, directions are not the attributes of 
God Jalla Jalalu wa Taala fi Ula. So there cannot be any up for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Taib. Then why do we face up when we make dua? Because there is a kiblat for dua. When we want to dua, we face up. Taib. I thought the kiblat of dua it was the kibla. It was the it was the kibla salat. No. Who said? The Qibla of Dua is the keep the direction where you go for your prayers, the Kaaba. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he prays sallallahu alaihi wasallam, after he pray, what do he what what does he what does he do? He turn to the right and he make Dua when he was facing the right. Tamam. And when you make Dua, you face upwards. Why do you have to face upwards? It's for you. It's not for Allah. Allah subhanahu wa taala is able to hear do, your Dua even you face downwards. Just like some kids, mashallah, they put their head between their two legs, then he make dua. Allah swt still can hear. No. <laughs> whatever it is, Allah swt is able to hear you in whatever direction you make dua. Like, why do you have to face up when you make dua? Number one, we say it is a qiblat for dua, and that is how we make dua, so that we can show our humility to Allah subhanahu wa taala. And human, we are used to. Humiliation when it comes to down, and we are used to to proud to pride when we comes to something which is up. So, halas, you make dua facing upwards. Just think that you are facing the blessings of Allah, the mercy of Allah, and you bring yourself downwards to humiliate yourself in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These kibla of dua facing upwards is for you, but it is not for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala doesn't need you to face kib to face upwards to accept your dua. Allah SWT can accept your dua wherever you face. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَرَبُّتُ بَعَلَيَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ We attest that he is not a body possessing form. We have mentioned about the body possessing form. Nor a substance restricted and limited. When we mention about attributes of creation, an example just now, sizes and this and that, some of the attributes of creation is also to take space. We have, we have sizes, and if it's too much, we are not able to, we are not able to fill in the space anymore. An example, mashallah, we have how many thirty students today? Takriban, lebih kurang, plus minus, thirty, yeah. Rabbi Ghafirli wa Tum Aaliya Inna Ka Anta Tawabul Rahim. Taib. If we have about hundred students, Taib, maybe we still can accommodate. But if we have two hundred students, can we accommodate in this room? We might not be able to accommodate. These are the restrictions of the creation. Taib, light. Masha Allah. Light. There's no limitation. It can come to space. It can come. It can come fill up. Even though we put thousand lights, you still can fill up this room. Even though you put hundred thousand lights, all those lights can still come into this room. But can it enter another room? Those lights, because of these barricades and barriers, can those lights enter another room? So it's still the attribute of creation. It's limited. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not restricted, neither limited. Jalla jalalu wa ta'ala fi ula. He does not resemble other bodies, either in limitation or in accepting division. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not resemble other bodies, either in limitation, all those limitations we have mentioned, tamam. or in accepting division. Human being can be divided. Yes, can be divided. Water can be divided. Yes, water can be divided. Everything can be divided. The only thing you don't divide human being because why? He is not able to live then. <laughs> but can he be divided? Yes, he can. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does not accept division. There's no such thing as we place a portion of Allah here and a portion of Allah there. It's not possible to say those kind of things. Rabbil Fili wa Tumaaliya inna ka anta tawabul rahim. Taib. We will stop here today, insha Allah. Tamam. And we will continue next week. We will continue next week. At the same time, I will request from all of you, if you are able at least to read two 
uh, you can read transcendence and you can read life and power and knowledge at least until number three tamam. and try to understand some things here because why if you prepare yourself you will definitely have some questions and ask in the class but if you don't prepare yourself you will definitely don't have any questions because why how to ask something you don't know about what to ask Huh? Am I right? Huh? How to ask something about you don't know what to ask huh? When you know something a little bit And you don't know some other things That is when you will start to have some questions So I would highly encourage all of you To read up before coming to the class And that is part of Amanah Tamam. That is doing just doing justice to religious knowledge. You have one month to read up all these things, these few things, yani, which can be completed in five minutes. <laughs> if you want to read up once, mashallah, please don't do once, at least twice. Tamam. <laughs> if you want to do five, six times every day, you want to read up once, mashallah, tabarakallah, you will come to the next class with full preparation and you will have a table of questions for me. تمام رب الفلي وتم عليا إنك أنت التواب